Hello, and welcome to the Gamer's Closet. I'm your host, Douglas Wheat, and today we're going to be talking about Jutland. Jutland is a World War I war game manufactured by Avalon Hill in 1967. It is rated for ages 12 and up, runs for about two hours of game time, and is rated for two players. But let's dig into it a little further, shall we? The Battle of Jutland was a naval battle fought between Britain's Royal Navy Grand Fleet under Admiral Sir John Jellicoe and the Imperial German Navy's High Seas Fleet under Vice Admiral Reinhard Scheer during the First World War. The battle unfolded in extensive maneuvering in three major engagements, the battlecruiser action, the fleet action, and the night action, from May 31st to June 1st, 1916, off the North Sea coast of Denmark's Jutland Peninsula. It was the largest naval battle and the only full-scale clash of battleships during the First World War. Jutland was also the last major battle in world history fought primarily by battleships. Fourteen British and eleven German ships sank with a total of 9,823 casualties. Both sides claimed victory. The British lost more ships and twice as many sailors, but succeeded in containing the German fleet. The British press criticized the Grand Fleet's failure to force a decisive outcome, while Scheer's plan of destroying a substantial portion of the British fleet also failed. At the end of 1916, after further unsuccessful attempts to reduce the Royal Navy's numerical advantage, the German Navy accepted that its surface ships had been successfully contained, subsequently turning its efforts and resources to unrestricted submarine warfare and the destruction of Allied and neutral shipping, which along with the Zimmerman telegram by April 1917 triggered the United States of America's declaration of war on Germany. Jutland was released in 1967 and was added to Avalon Hill's long series of successful war games. This particular game was a little novel because it borrowed heavily from miniatures and had actually no board to play on and used a very novel system of search graphs. The game was later reprinted in 1974 with several additional intermediate scenarios. This game does come with multiple pieces. It comes with several German hit and search sheets, several British hit and search sheets, one time record sheet, two task force boards, one gunnery table for the basic and advanced game, 120 pieces, 60 German, 60 British, one battle manual, one basic instruction booklet, six battle area markers, and two range finders. If you do need further hit and search sheets. You can find them on BoardGameGeek.com for printout, and there are some high quality prints you can make off of that site. The object of Jutland is to sink the, your opponent's ships. However, you must first find out where their ships are located in the vast expanse of the North Sea. Location and movement of ships are kept in pencil secretly by each player on their own fleet search sheet. When contact is made, a battle develops. Because there is no battle board, ship-to-ship -ship combat is conducted on any flat surface, such as a large table or floor. Battle area markers are placed on the flat surface to determine exactly where each die-cut ship counter should be entering into battle. Battle formations are predetermined by each player on the task force section of the hit record sheet, which is on the reverse side of the search sheet. The battle maneuver gauge determines how many ships may maneuver for combat. Once under fire, as determined by the range finder, battle is resolved by consulting the basic game gunnery table and rolling the die. The time record card determines length of play as it alternates between searching for opposing task forces and their actual combat. The die cut ship counters are only used during the battle procedure. As you can see here on the bottom left is the ship's name and it also lists the movement factor and protection factor on the bottom right. And then you have a listing for the stern, bow, and broadside gunnery factors. The broadside gunnery factor is the relative strength of firepower of firing at defending ships on an angle instead of the front. The protection factor is a relative ability to withstand attacker's firepower, so it would count as the ship's armor, and the movement factor is the distance the ships may move when engaged in battle. The British control the North Sea and are blockading the Germans, thus the burden of attack falls on the German player. For the German player to win, they have to have more ships remaining in play than the British at the end of the June 1st, 12 p.m. turn. The British player wins if they sink more ships than the German player by the June 1st, 12 p.m. time limit. A draw occurs if neither condition is met. Hereafter, the British player will be referred to as the blue player or blue, and the German player will be referred to as black or the black player. 
search sheet hexagons are going to be referred to as squares. To set up this game, Blue obtains a fleet search sheet that is backed up by the British hit record sheet. Black obtains one backed up copy by a German hit record sheet. Both are found in the same pad. Set aside all the light cruisers marked as CL and all the destroyers marked as DD as they are not used in the basic game. Blue stacks their ship counters on the British Task Force board. At the start of the game, British ships must be broken down historically into three task forces as indicated thereon. Black does likewise. Players should keep their own task force boards away from opponents' view. Both players refer to the fleet makeup section on their hit record sheets. For each task force formed in the previous step, decide what will be their battle formations by writing down the number of ships, number of columns of ships, yard intervals between the columns. Blue marks the starting position of their three task forces on the fleet search sheet. Task Force 1 starts on A-17, number 2 starts on D-13, and number 3 starts on K-9. Black's entire fleet starts at BB-16. Each whole square on the search sheet represents 36,000 yards or one hour sailing time at an average speed of 18 knots. Neither player can move into partial sea squares containing coastal line or islands. Germans, however, may move through the Heligoland Square and British may enter starting bases. To record movement, draw a continuous pencil line from the starting squares through every square in which each task force passes. Periodically identify each pencil Pencil line as its task force number and hour of arrival. German movement into shaded whole sea squares means it has been spotted by the British or Norwegian shore patrol. When spotted, black must disclose their square location but does not need to state the number and types of ships. German hope for victory lies in the strategy of attacking British fleets in detail before they are able to unite. This situation is reflected by the initial move whereby the Black Fleet may set sail from BB-16 anytime May 30, midnight, and thereafter, passing through as many squares as they wish until they have either A, been spotted, which is moved into a shaded whole C square, or B, reached the square they wish to begin the search procedure from. Black now figures their total hours at sea, marking off one hour for every square passed into by the task forces that have traveled the farthest. Since it would take British ships five hours to raise steam, Black may move their task forces an additional four squares, marking off four more hours of sailing time. This stage is now set for the search procedure. The search procedure consists of five steps. Step 1. Both players simultaneously move all task forces one square in any direction permissible. Players are not required to move any task forces and may move only those desired. In step two, black searches first. Black must call out the location of every square in which they have a task force. They also have the option to call out the location of any and all squares adjacent to their task forces, but is not required to do so. As each square is called, blue must state whether or not the British forces are therein, although they do not have to state the number and types of ships involved in this movement. In step three, blue conducts their search turn exactly as black did in step two. Step 4, A, if neither side has been sighted for play, proceed to step 5, or B, if sightings have been made whether opposing forces are in squares adjacent to each other, play proceeds to step 5, do not go into the battle procedure as of yet, or C, if sightings have been made where opposing forces are in the same square, proceed immediately to the battle procedure. And finally, step five, mark off one hour of time. Both players must reform ships currently on a common square in a new task force, making proper adjustments to the task force boards and fleet makeup sections. Now then revert to step one, as I have just mentioned, and start again. The battle procedure is the reenactment of the task force search and encounter on a ship-to-ship -ship scale. The battle area markers negate the need of a battle board. There are blobs of the compass shown in the upper right-hand corner of the fleet search sheets. They are used merely as reference points for battle and represent the centers of search squares where sightings have been made. Players conduct actual battle on any flat surface of at least 3 by 4, preferably one on which the ship counters will not slide too easily like a rug, for instance. 
The battle procedure consists of five steps. Step one, place one battle area marker in the appropriate center of the battle surface. Both players simultaneously now transfer their ship counters from their task force boards to the battle surface, facing them in the direction in which they had entered the search sheet squares where the sighting was made. Ships must be placed in a formation written down in the fleet makeup section with the front row 18,000 yards away from the center of the battle area. Use the range finder to determine distance. Place ships in line directly against each other front to back. Space each column as stated in the fleet makeup. In some cases, the distance between closest ship of opposing forces will vary according to the direction each task force is traveling. They could be as far apart as 36,000 yards if approaching from opposite directions such as east and west, or as close as proximity of 12,000 yards if approaching from adjacent directions such as west and southwest. This is unimportant and although maximum sighting range during daylight is 24,000 yards, it is assumed actual sighting is made at such an alternate distance. Step 2, the maximum nighttime sighting range is 6,000 yards. If the time record card indicates that play is at a night hour, which are the shaded hours, opposing forces must move within 3,000 yards of the center of the battle area marker. Step 3, if unengaged forces are known to be in search squares adjacent to the sighting square, place additional markers 36,000 yards apart in proper directional relationship. They do not bring on unengaged forces at this time. Step 4, players must now conduct battle as directed by the maneuver and fire section, which I will be going over in a second. And Step 5, at the conclusion of battles for all sightings, play reverts to the search procedure, as I have just stated. Black always moves their ships first, followed by blue. In the firing portion, black fires all ships first, followed by blue again. But since both ships are firing simultaneously, a British ship sunk by black's firing turn may fire in blue's firing turn before removal from play. Six maneuvers and fire turns equal one hour of sailing time. At the end of the six maneuver and fire turn, play reverts to battle procedure for all other battle engagements, if any, to be fought in the current hour. Use spare battle area markers. Do not disturb battles already in progress. At the end of the sixth maneuver and fire turn for all other battle engagements, mark off one hour. Both players then move all task forces on their search sheets one square, and if such movement brings them into battle squares, they too are placed in proper daytime, nighttime battle procedures. Whenever the direction of battle takes endangered ships into what would be an adjacent search square, all unengaged task forces in such squares must be brought into battle. Battles continue in this manner hour after hour until opposing ships are all sunk or withdrawal occurs. Battle that are concluded in less than six maneuvers and fire turns of a particular hour are considered one hour in duration anyhow. Ships are moved individually with the use of the battle maneuver gauge. They must move in the following formations whenever possible. A. Line ahead, a single file of ships. All trailing ships must follow behind lead ships. Task forces of three or less must maneuver in line ahead. Or B. Column of divisions. Two or more single files, three ships minimum per file. For best maneuverability, intervals between columns should equal the length of the columns. In any maneuver turn, formations may change directions by A, the line ahead turn. The lead ship, which is the flagship, may turn right or left at any angle up to 180 degrees. Trailing ships may only turn at the flagship's pivot point. B, the front to flank turn. All ships may turn right or left at any angle up to 90 degrees at the same instance and continue abreast. C, the flank to front turn. British ships may revert to the original line as I just stated, turning only in the direction that will place the flagship in the lead once again. Or D, the battle away turn. Not allowed by the British. All German ships of the line may completely reverse course 180 degrees at the same instance. Whenever battle losses chop up formations, ships must be moved individually to form new formations as quickly as possible. Formations are allowed more than one directional change in a single maneuver turn. 
Ships may pass through enemy formations if it looks apparent they would ram each other otherwise. A ship may not end its move stacked on top of an enemy ship. Players may arbitrarily spread ships apart to allow pass-throughs. Firing does not occur until both player ships have been maneuvered. Firing ranges between opposing individual ships is explained on the rangefinder. In the basic game, all firing is considered broadside to broadside regardless of actual facings. Battle odds are determined by matching up the broadside gunnery factor of the firing ship against the protection factor of the ship being fired on. For example, odds for the Ajax firing on the Posen would be 6 to 6 or 1 to 1. Firing ships may gang up and direct their fire all against one opposing ship. For example, the Ajax and the Aaron could fire against the Posen at 12 to 6 or a 2 to 1 odds. Ships cannot split their fire against more than one opposing ship in the same turn. Ships fire just once in a single turn. Ships must have a clear line of sight to fire. They may not fire over their own or over enemy ships. The attacker may resolve each individual ship-to-ship -ship battle in any order they choose. All battles are resolved by consulting the basic gunnery table card. One firing turn is completed when both players have fired from all of their ships within range to fire. After all firing has been resolved, play reverts to maneuver for the next turn. As soon as the closest ships of opposing task forces are beyond the visual contact points from each other, battle ends. On the search sheet, the withdrawing task force's pencil line is extended into the square into which it is heading. Forces of the opposing player remain in their current square. One hour is marked off and play reverts to the search procedure. Withdrawal towards a prohibited square is not allowed. Instead, forces must turn and fight or head in a permissible direction. During search procedure, British task forces may escape off the sheet through the six English Channel whole squares and the 14 whole squares to the north. German task forces may escape only through the four whole squares at Skagerrak. Task forces may return in the same area from which they escaped, but may return through different squares allowing proper time. For instance, Task Force 1 could leave through DD2 at 1 a.m. If it returns through DD5, it cannot do so until 5 a.m. or thereafter. Players must write the hours of escape and arrival in the proper squares. For the basic game, you will want to use the basic gunnery table. Battles are resolved on the basic gunnery table only. Ignore hit record sheets for this purpose as all hits result in sinkings. If you do wish for an advanced game, you'll want to flip it over to the advanced section. Well, this covers the rules for the basic game, but if you do wish to have a stronger game, I suggest checking the battle manual because it has all of the instructions for the tournament game, which adds greater realism and depth into play of this game. Well, this has been an overview of Jutland. Jutland is a very novel Avalon Hill nautical game uh, for the fact it comes with no board. You play on a table, you play on the floor, you play wherever you want to. It has a very neat search mode, which you play on charts and graphs, and then once you actually make contact, then you play on whatever surface uh, you would like. Um, it is a very novel game, meaning that um, it doesn't repeat the same way ever, because, again, there's no board. So you'll get a nice, fun time every time you play this, because it's never the same. The other neat thing about this game, it comes with a, an advanced mode, so it's good for the basic player in the introductory strategy game, or it's good for the advanced player that wants something a little beefier for a war game. Uh, the game itself goes online anywhere from about $20 to $100. $20 for a good average copy, $100 is if it's unpunched from the original editions. Um, but the game itself is relatively affordable. Um, it is pretty easy to understand for a novice if you go through the basic campaign. The advanced campaign kind of gets into a little bit more with gunnery, strategy, tactics, and things of that nature. So it's a little tougher for the average gamer, but it's something you can work into, which I think is a really nice feature. So if you haven't played Jutland before, I would recommend playing this game. Well, that's it from us here at the Gamer's Closet. We'd like to thank you for checking out our video on Jutland from Avalon Hill. If there's a game in the future you'd like us to review or go over, please put it in the comments below. Please hit subscribe so that we can be the first to check out our future content. And as always, please, have a great gaming day.